Hi, everyone, and welcome to episode 110 of Finding Your Way Through Therapy. Can't believe I got to that number. But, um, you know, we had Lynn on last week, and her message is so important. You know, I think that we need to process a little bit of what happened with her, but she's going to kind of like tell us about the tail end of the conviction here. But Lynn Key someone who wants to really make sure that you understand that sometimes even getting justice doesn't give you justice. Uh, and that's not only for her, but for her sister. Yes. So I'd like to welcome Lynn Key again to the podcast. Hey, Steve, how are you today? You know what? I'm excited to hear the second part, not because of anything, but I think that message needs to be clear to everyone. So I think this is mm. m- very much w- warranted that we do two separate episodes. Well, so, I certainly you- appreciate you having me back, truly. Well, if it can get someone's help or understand a little bit, that's the goal of this podcast too. Mm. Um, let's, you know, for those who didn't listen to the first podcast, how about we just like, you do a quick in- intro of yourself and maybe say, you know, we left it off as there was a conviction and maybe you can just recap a little bit of that and then we'll go from there. Sure. So um, as Steve said, my name is Lynn Key. I'm 37 years old. I am a uh, Sorry, just a second. I should have hit do not disturb. Um, I am 37 years old. I am from Massachusetts, born and bred. Um, I am a survivor of childhood uh, rape, to be quite frank. My sister was also a survivor of childhood rape. Um, Unfortunately, she lost her battle with um, the addiction that resulted from her trauma. Uh, in January. And I am now uh, speaking out basically about trauma as the gateway drug and about how important early and adequate trauma intervention and ongoing trauma informed care is when it comes to um, not just surviving an event like this, but navigating the justice system and the pitfalls that exist within the justice system, which can be a secondary trauma. And then um, learning how to thrive, you know, because um, as somebody that's been through that, I'm well aware that I will never be the person I was before um, the rape, but I am a much better person today, I think, because of what I've learned through the process of working through that trauma. Um, So I'm thriving now, but that has been a very long and uh, difficult process. So uh, that's who I am and what I'm here to talk about. Um, What I like to to get back to is, uh, so we, we, we talked a little bit about, you know, the grooming phase, we talked about other things that went on. And then when we finished the last episode, we talked about being in court and, you know, your sister had had her conviction for her rape that she went through, which is brutal. And then you were talking about your, the conviction that you're uh, what I call a victimizer, offender, Mm. whatever you want to call them um, had done to you. So we left it off there. And, okay. you know, most people think, yay, win for Lynn, let's move on. That's not reality. That's ab- absolutely not reality. So I'd like you to share more about this reality. You know, Steve, it's a really uh, appropriate thing that you just said there, which is like, yay, justice has been served, time to move on. Because um, that is how I felt, and I'm sure how my sister felt leading up to the completion of um, the process with the justice system. Uh, Both of us being raised in uh, a military and public service centric family, we were raised to really believe in the justice system and the American way of doing things. And uh, basically we're told that we would receive some modicum of healing through the process. And it was, in fact, quite the opposite. Um, I know for my sister, her offender actually ran from the courthouse. So even though he was convicted, he was on the lam for two years and it took America's Most Wanted getting involved to actually apprehend him. Um, And as far as mine was concerned, it took two trials, uh, which took four years to get to, um, to get a conviction. The first trial was a mistrial. One juror would not vote guilty. Um, The state did offer my offender a plea deal, um, but he did not want to take it. Um, They, in fact, offered him zero jail time, which I felt at the time was a slap in the face and am quite glad that he didn't take it, to be frank. Speaking Um, of secondary trauma for others. Yeah. Who, who plea out yeah but. well their their thought process was that it would save me the secondary trauma of another trial but in reality after that much fight 
um, having him serve no jail time would have been extremely re-traumatizing on a whole different level for me. So um, essentially what ended up happening is both gentlemen got convicted. And around the time of my conviction, the second trial, um, my sister's offender was actually caught. So believe it or not, the very same week that my offender was sentenced and he did receive three to four years in state prison with an additional five years of probation, my sister's offender was also apprehended and sentenced. And um, the difference between uh, a grooming type rape situation and a violent type rape situation, which all rape is violent. It's a power thing, right? Correct. Um, I was going to correct I, I you do, on that, but I, didn't I do be have to, I do have to make that point. That's something I've learned in therapy, right? Um, it's about the power, not about the physical violence, but the difference between it, a, it's, it's minimizing what a victim went through when it was through grooming because it was still violent. I, I agree, sir. So the and I'm sorry with the sir thing, you know, I'm going to keep doing fine. that. So um, ahead, at the ma'am. end of the day, the way thanks at the end of the day, the way that um the state sees that plays out a lot differently as well when it comes to the time that these offenders are given. And I'm not arguing for or against that. I just want to make that clear for anyone that's going through this. There is typically a large difference in time given in a grooming situation versus a traditionally violent rape situation um and her offender was given 15 to 18 years um with an additional two years um to be served for the running so that's where we left off and um it was bittersweet um i'm not gonna lie obviously it was um it was somewhat healing it was closure to a certain extent to see him convicted, to see him sentenced, to see him led away in handcuffs. Um, with my sister, I know that she was able to sleep at night, um, yeah. for lack of a better term, because she never really slept at night ever again, to be honest. But she was looking over her shoulder actively, not knowing where this man had disappeared to for the two years he was on the lam. So when he was finally behind bars, she was able to move on from that aspect of the trauma. Um again, move on is a relative term. So um, we were basically left with like an empty sinking feeling, I guess is the best way to describe it. Because the thing that we had been pursuing in place of our healing, you know what I mean? Like the thing we were pursuing to heal did not heal us. Now, I personally also was in therapy this entire time. I think I mentioned in the last episode that I had been exposed to therapy at a very young age due to behavioral issues with, you know, between myself and my mother as a young girl. And I'm glad for that because um, the one thing I did maintain throughout the entire process, um, although there were gaps here and there, but just consistently throughout the entire process was cognitive behavioral traditional therapy, whereas my sister did not. Um, I think I also mentioned that I had been a really straight edge kid. Um, I had never messed with even smoking a cigarette, drinking, smoking weed, none of that until after um, I was I was um, raped. Um, So for me, after the rape, that is what started to happen. Um, This is prior to the closure through the justice system. Right. Um, My sister, on the other hand, had been a kid that was experimenting. And when she was raped, she locked that right down. So she kind of just like focused on her herself, her school, um, the boyfriend that she later got um, and ended up graduating, whereas I dropped out first in my class um, to preserve my high school record because I literally could not get myself to go to school anymore. Um, So. That is really what I want to focus on in in this particular discussion, because that had long lasting and profound impacts. It is the number one thing, if I were to have to pinpoint one thing that led to me surviving and thriving and my sister, unfortunately, losing her battle. Um, And that is, again, seeking out treatment, seeking out therapy, seeking out um, later on a trauma informed therapy. And then for me, that progressed into all different types of therapy. Um, and I'm not a trained professional, obviously I am the person receiving therapy. So when I talk about this, it's going to be in very loose terms, but for me, my healing, um, 
required a whole lot more than traditional cognitive behavioral therapy. Yeah. Um, and my sister, once she was unable to hold down the feelings, uh, once those feelings came bubbling back up in a flashback in a doctor's office, um, and to this day, I contend she should have been hospitalized right then and there in the doctor's office. Um, right. She was unable to even get the therapy that she needed to get that under control, to get back to a place where she was able to work through things, even at a cognitive behavioral therapy level. Right. Um, so it's just super important to me that we talk about that. Um well, let's start off with a couple of things. Mm -hmm. I want to like trauma informed care gets thrown around and people don't really explain what that means. Mm -hmm. And trauma informed care has to do with looking at the whole person, the whole situation, their life situation, how they got there and so on and so forth. And not yes. pretend you know everything because, you know, the, the, the stuff that happens is that some therapists and again, I'm not pointing fingers. I guess I am in some ways, but not too much is that, oh, well, OK, you got your conviction. So. You should be happy. Uh, or your life started when you got groomed or you got violently raped and they're all uh -huh. violent. Um, and no, your life was something before that. And your life has changed significantly since then. Uh -huh. And you need to be informed on the whole of the human being, the whole situation. And I think it's important for me to explain that to the audience who may not know what trauma informed care means and uh -huh. how that has impact. I think that your message of trauma being the gateway drug is essential for people to understand in a trauma informed situation. I don't pretend I know everything and nor I, I promise I don't know everything, but knowing enough about trauma is to not go and say, okay, so you put yourself in that situation. I'm not saying this. I'm just, of course. Uh, oh, you put don't yourself worry. in that situation. Now you got your conviction. All right, let's get you better. Mm. No, that's like not even a quarter of the story. That's like even the tenth of the story. So mm. I want to make sure we, kind of like talked about that with people because I think it's very important that we have that. You can hear me well, right? I can. And you know what, Steve, that brings to mind my first interaction with a new therapist when my father was starting to notice the impacts that the rape was having on me before I reported it. And this is a very key moment in, in the situation. Right. So I told you in the last episode, and I'm glad we got into um, my early childhood, my sister's early childhood, right? I told you that I had had a family therapist that I had been seeing since, since I was a kid. Well, at a certain point when you're like 13, 14, years old, you really don't want to be seeing the same therapist that your mother sees, right? Especially if you have a strained relationship with your mother. So I had kind of at a certain point put up that boundary. I recommend it on my point. Right, <laughs> right. And it just so happened that that was the same time that this gentleman was starting to um, groom me. So when uh, I was deep into the situation, probably about halfway through the year that he spent actually um, raping me. Um, my father had noticed that I was having difficulty getting up for school, that I was staying up really late, um, that, you know, I didn't seem to be cleaning my room or showering as often as I had been in the past. And typically I was very much the opposite. And typically I was very vocal about what was going on with me. And obviously he didn't know what was going on with me and I couldn't talk to him about what was actually going on with me. So he basically told me that he was going to make me go to therapy. Um, he would find a new therapist and we were going to figure it out. And I got to that therapist and I told him what was going on. And this gentleman, I will never forget, he barely asked a single question. He certainly did not probe to see if there was something that he wasn't missing, I can tell you that much. I just told him what my symptoms were. And he told me that I had overachiever syndrome, that I was burning out and that that was my problem. And you know what? In a lot of ways, he was right because, you know, I had been overcompensating by delving into school um, and by, you know, being quote unquote the perfect, you know, most perfect version of myself that I could be, right? And this one more thing, because I had my early childhood trauma, right? This one more thing was the straw that broke the camel's back where I could not overcompensate anymore. But I was so disgusted by that because in that moment, I'm like, sir, what you don't know is that my guitar teacher is fucking me on a weekly basis. He also happens to be my dad's 
you know, one of my dad's best friends also happens to be an employee, also happens to be engaged to a woman I very much like. And I don't know what to do. I can't right. talk to anybody about it. And I certainly can't talk to you about it. And that was that. That was the one and only therapy session that I ever went to with him. Now, it's funny because that actually did end up continuing to play out after I reported the rape that did not stop that accelerated as I said a few minutes ago I could no longer get myself out of bed to go to school on time I could no longer um, you know at the last minute bang out my papers or my assignments I could no longer present the way that I had been presenting for so long to the point where I knew that I needed to leave high school in order to preserve the record that I had um, built up to that point in time. College was very important to me. My whole identity was right. I wanted to um, make a difference in the world. I was going to go to Harvard and be a prosecutor. Like I was, I was going to do big things. Right. And now I couldn't even get myself out of bed to go to school. So the last thing that I wanted to do was trash that record. Um, and I remember um, that really, really, really ramped up when I met my first like real boyfriend and um, decided to start smoking weed. Now that was not for nine months after I reported this. So for a full nine months, I just struggled on, um, you know, trying to live the way I had lived prior. Um, and everybody was kind of like, what the hell is wrong with you? Like, you need to start putting this in your past. And that was the most frustrating feeling because it's not like I was sitting around all day obsessing over the fact that I had been raped or obsessing over what was going to happen with this man. And by the way, that was hard enough to not do that. And I was successfully not doing that, but I could not get out of my own way. And I had absolutely no idea why. Right. And I think that what I, you know, I rolled my eyes. So if you're on YouTube, you mm -hmm. saw that. But, you know, like, oh, yeah, well, you know, you, you got it off your chest. Come on, move on. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah, I didn't think of that. Thank you so much. I'll, I'll do that. Thank you. Mm -hmm. it, it's not that easy. It's not what happens. And, you know, you, you know, I most people I know, you talk about trauma being the gateway drug, and then it leads to marijuana or what have you, mm -hmm. because you got to deal with the fucking symptoms. <laughs> Yes. And you know, the effect of the actual trauma, it's been a really long time since I like told this story in this much detail, right, Steve, the effects of the actual trauma prior to me ever picking up my first substance were the exact same effects that being on substances had on me. So it's weird that you just pointed yeah. that out. Um, like I'm the type when I'm using and at this point in my life, I, I want everybody to know I am California sober, I do use weed, I smoke weed as one of my my um, coping mechanisms. Hashtag I have come California off all sober. of my. I have come off all of my pharmaceuticals, and um, you know, at this point in my life, I do not chase my marijuana addiction the way that I would, if you want to call it that, that I would chase any other substance. I don't drink. Um, I don't do any other mind altering substances. You, I have had some plant medicine experiences under the guidance of a shaman, for real, a shaman. Um, right. But I just want to be clear: I don't judge anybody else's sobriety or recovery. And for those who missed the last episode, how, how long have you been sober now? It's 18 months now. Congratulations mm -hmm. again. That's always important to, for me to point out. Congratulations. Thank you. And and much different from the seven years that I had um, prior to that severe injury um, that led to my relapse. Because again, I was using my job and um, basically like worldly success or success in the eyes of society, becoming the person I thought I was supposed to be all along, right, as my means to recovery. So when that inevitably hit a roadblock or hit a bump in the road, right, um, my recovery went right out the window with it, you know, um, uh, essentially, I, go ahead. And I don't want to go too off uh, the topic because that's mm -hmm. important too. And I want to focus a little bit more about like, you know, um, I, you talk about trauma being the gateway drug yes. leads to marijuana. Does yes. it lead to anybody else or mm -hmm. anything else? Or anybody oh, absolutely. Else? Maybe anybody absolutely. too. But. Oh, no, it was crazy for me. So for me, right. Uh, nine months after after I've reported it, I'm struggling along. I'm with a I'm with a boyfriend. Right. Uh, brand new thing in my life. Had never had a real boyfriend prior to that. You know, you have schoolyard crushes, you have schoolyard relationships, but you, you've never had a real boyfriend. So um, this is like the boyfriend I went to high school prom with. Now, he when I met him, he was a childhood friend and he had smoked weed. He knew I was like straight edge and I wasn't down for any of that. So when we started hooking up, right, like 
relationship wise because I wasn't having sex on my own yet either. Um, basically, I um, I was supporting him in his attempts to stay away from smoking weed, from drinking and all that stuff. And he was he was successful at it. Um, and, and taking he, care of uh, someone else is another way to deal with trauma. But, that is uh, actually that is actually very true. And it goes back to being parentified um, when I was go. a kid and all of that. Right. All things you learn through therapy, Steve. Um, I years wish I knew of a it. good therapist, but anyway. <laughs> right? <laughs> but years of it. So essentially, he he about a month in had a mess up, had a little had a little slip, whatever. Told me about it. Rinse and repeat. A month later, and then the third time, I showed up at his house with my grandmother, and he was high as a kite, like the classic, like Towley from freaking South Park levels of high. And thank God my grandmother was clueless; she had no idea. But I was mortified, and at that point, I decided that I had to let go of whether or not he was going to smoke weed. If he wanted to smoke weed, he was going to smoke weed, right. and that was that. But that was also the beginning of the end for me because then I was around it. So then I'm sitting there, and I'm in you know, the mind state and the physical state of having just suffered major trauma for an extended period of time. And I'm surrounded by all these people that are using drugs to cope. And eventually I got curious. Um, and I was thinking to myself, and I'll never forget it. Like, if he can't stop, like it's, there's got to be something about it that draws him to it that prevents him from being able to stop and that in that moment was something that i wanted i just wanted the 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 pain essentially to stop i wanted my mind to stop racing i wanted to numb the intense feelings that i was having and so i actually asked him if i could smoke with him and it's funny because i was so afraid of it that i didn't even like actually hit the bowl or the joint like he like shotgun he like blew the smoke in my mouth because I was so afraid of like ruining my voice being a singer right um but the the very first time I smoked weed um it was mission accomplished it was mission accomplished like I'll never forget it it was June um it was like midnight because we snuck out and I was walking down my childhood street and just everything was brighter and like for a minute I just like forgot that mm my life sucked and I essentially wanted to die. Now at that point in time, I didn't, I didn't want to die. Like I wasn't suicidal or having suicidal ideation, but I had completely lost my way and completely lost my zest for life, like struggling to get out of bed and care for myself, as I said. Um, so from that day on, I never went a day without smoking weed again. And it just very quickly progressed uh, from there. I'm sure this poor kid was like, what the hell did I do? Because like we uh, no sooner had started doing that than we watched like blow with Johnny Depp. And I'm like, gee, I wonder where we could get some cocaine. And he was like, wait, what? And like proceed my journey down the deep, dark road of addiction. Um, I was just I was just out to try if this is good and it's getting me out of my head then what else is there that can get me out of my head? And obviously also very concerned about addiction, but you know, that's not going to happen to me. Right. You're, like you're I'm, I'm somehow different. Yeah. I'm somehow different. And it was even to the point where Steve, like I didn't like drinking, you know why? Cause it messed me up too much. Like I truly did just want the pain to stop. Just right. wanted my thoughts to either stop being so overwhelming or get a little more organized. You know what I mean? I just, I just wanted it to stop. Um, and so when I found something that made it stop, I went full steam ahead. Um, by the time I made it back to school in the fall, I transferred back from Ashland to Northbridge in order to drop out because I didn't want to drop out in the town that my father was the fire chief in um, and like embarrass him essentially. But that's the thing. People should have understood what was going on. And um, part of why I'm speaking out about this is I think – it's not even so much trauma informed care as just people not understanding trauma period. Yeah. Well, we, me and you can have a long conversation about that because I think that trauma is something that either people want you to erase because somehow there's an eraser for it mm -hmm. or that you're going to get over it because everyone gets over trauma. And I, you know, I've mentioned this several times on my podcast. I always tell people you don't get over trauma ever. You get through trauma, no. you get to the other side. That doesn't mean it's still not there. Uh, and, but you know, when people want you to get over it, marijuana sounds good. Cocaine sounds good. Uh -huh. It sounds good. Opiates yep. sound good. Anything yep. to just get over it. And yep. it's almost like a message when you're not trauma informed, you give the message of get over it. 
And then that leads to even worse roads, in my opinion. It, it does. And that's exactly what went down with Amanda. So with me, right, as I said, I was very high functioning in my, again, like trauma affected way, right? Um, right, before the rape. And then the rape put me over the edge. My sister, on the other hand, was very affected, it would seem, right? And then her rape made her lean into reformation, I guess. I think she almost, and I, we did have conversation about this many, many times. I think she was kind of like, you know, I'm gonna do what Lynn used to do. And I'm just gonna focus on school. And I'm just gonna focus on my family and focus on, you know, my boyfriend who's not taking me out to parties and just get through it. When she graduated high school, which was a proud moment for all of us, um, she went right into work. And then when she got pregnant at 19, she was like a phenomenal, phenomenal mother. All the while, at no point in time addressing what had happened to her. She could not even talk about it. Like the America's Most Wanted episode, filming those episodes were some of the most difficult days that she had from the time that the conviction happened until the time when she had her flashback and snapped um, later on in her early 20s in that doctor's office. Um, so, you know, for me, I was affected, right? I was right. no longer able to cope and function the way that I had beforehand, but I was facing my triggers. So, uh, there were certain songs that would come on the radio and it would remind me of this gentleman and his band, and I would not change the channel. That is key. And not everybody can do that. And not everybody can do that right away. Some people, it takes years to be exposed to a trigger and to allow themselves to continue to be exposed to said trigger in order to, you know, classically condition themselves back into it being a neutral item. And to this day, I still hear those songs. And my first thought is that gentleman and his band, but it's a a millisecond and it triggers no actual emotion. Whereas right. back in the day when it first happened, it would trigger all sorts of emotion. And I would think about it for a while. Right. And I think that a lot of people listen to X, Y, Z, you say songs, but whatever, because they're like, Oh, if I can get through this song, I'm probably over it. Yeah. That's definitely what people want. They want to get over it. And mm -hmm. I, I think that the message is that, you know, it, you don't need to be a tough person, a tough woman, a tough guy because that shit hurts Ugh. and just want to normalize a little bit of that before we go on because i've had both like people hang up or listen change the song the song or what have you or they go through it see i i'm okay now i listen to the whole song no that's not exactly how that works i'm sorry that that's i wish it worked that way it'd be freaking great i'd do it with everyone but it's just not how it works. Steve, I love that conversation. Um, I love that, what you just said, because at the end of the day, right, it wasn't until 10 years in that I finally had a therapist say to me, look, just because you've logically processed and desensitized up here does not mean that you are healed. And I was shook. I had no idea what the hell she was even talking about. I'm like, ma'am, I'm sorry, but isn't the entire point of healing to not be messed up about it in your head to logically be able to have processed it. It doesn't upset you when you talk about it anymore and to be able to be exposed to the triggers that right. would have upset you in the past. Isn't that what healing is? And she's like, no, <laughs> no, there is head healing and there is heart healing. And you, my friend are all up here. And that is why I stayed sick, Steve. That's why I'm so about, um, a holistic approach, a holistic approach. And it's funny that you define trauma informed care as a holistic approach, because that's what it's taken for me to find actual healing. Don't get me wrong. It was super important for me. And I was able to have that seven years of sobriety without a real program and work that job and get out of bed and all of that stuff. Right. Um, because I had done the CBT logical processing um, reduction in how, how, heavily my triggers impacted me but i was by no means healed i was by no means healed my life was absolute chaos i was miserable i was miserable right being hyper busy is also a trauma response oh i was either go or stop so right. i all all week i'd work like 60 hours a week i'd be talking about decompressing my day um for literal hours with multiple different people after work and then i would crash all weekend like it was it was not healthy at all um yeah. I am in a way different place today. And, and it's, it's as a result of 
branching out into more than just talking about it, more than just logically processing it. But I bring up the fact that early on, I was in therapy talking about it. And I was on my own because I found out about, you know, Pavlov's dogs and classical conditioning and science class. And I'm just a nerd like that. I'm like, let's try this on myself. I probably shouldn't run from this trigger if I can avoid running from this trigger. You know, and obviously you have to be safe in the environment that you're doing that. And again, right. big nerd, like I did a whole bunch of my own research. This is the early 2000s. I didn't have a therapist to walk me through that particular type of therapy. Right. So did but you I'm glad a I did it. So you can get through it. Right. Seriously. Right. Um, but like I, I I'm just glad I did it because that prevented me from pushing it down right. um, and having it resurface when I wasn't ready, which is what happened with Amanda. And I think that's something that I would like to get into if you'd like to talk about that. Please let go ahead. I'm, I, I'm all ears. Okay, cool. So with Amanda, right. Um, as I said, in the last episode, she was just naturally a more, she would internalize things a lot more than me. I would externalize them. I would let off steam. She would go into her room and, you know, write in a journal. Um, and we have so many journal entries from the time that she was a kid until, you know, right before her death. It's crazy to read. Excuse me for the burp, guys. Uh, wicked rude of me. But anyway, um, essentially, she she did the complete opposite of what I did. She would not go to therapy. And my parents were, again, like I said early on in our childhood, Childhood, they were very much of the opinion that like they should support us in however we feel we need to heal. So they supported me in being very vocal and in wanting to talk about it. And they supported her in not wanting to talk about it and critically not wanting to go to therapy. Um, mm -hmm. Now, I don't agree with forcing her to talk about her rape in therapy but I do think as a young child, we made a mistake as a family there. We should have had her in therapy, whether she spoke at all or not, just to build a relationship with that therapist. Again, coulda, woulda, shoulda, no judgment. This is just in retrospect. You know and, what I mean? And finding your way through therapy, which is the name of the podcast, right? I remind people that even being in the presence of a therapist and talking about the weather, talking mm -hmm. about music sports whatever maybe one day you'll open up maybe you won't but exactly. my experience has always been that you know people are like oh you're talking about the weather with your client i'm like eventually it'll come around i really don't care when they come around and yeah. that patience about trauma informed it doesn't even need to be trauma informed i think it's mental health informed uh, is that you can't say all right even in my podcast i didn't go all right uh, Lynn, let's uh, hear about your most painful memory of this and let's really dig into it right away. Right. Because that's just sc so screwed up. That's not uh. how you do it. And then eventually people will open up. And I, I think that that's what is lost when, you know, people are like, oh, you shouldn't force anyone in therapy. I guess that's true. But you can also have someone who's willing to be sitting there with you and just engaging you so that you become a safe person. I know uh. I do eye movement desensitization, reprocessing, EMDR for trauma. And I typically refuse to do it within the first six months of knowing a client because I need to gain that trust. Very smart. And you know, Steve, what you just reminded me of is oversharing and over willingness to open up, which is what I exhibit is also a trauma response. Okay. But so it's also it's what leads you to run. Yes, exactly. So, so my sister shutting down, that was the way her trauma presented me being over zealous about sharing and overly quick to to open up was 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 my trauma playing out as well you know but critically at least i had that safe person and unfortunately for her she did not now when when she was um about 22 23 years old right the kids were like three um she had an issue that she had to go into the pcp for and the pcp was probably going to have to uh do something down in her nether regions that was going to potentially cause pain and she was aware that triggers are a thing and the last time she had physical pain in that area aside from giving birth which also kind of triggered her was the rape right um she asked me to accompany her to the doctor um so she was looking back on it she must have been way more aware of how close to the surface that stuff was than she let on uh we get to the doctor's office we let the doctor know what's going on the doctor goes to do the procedure and the second that he touched her she snapped and when i say snapped i was in the room steve i was right there with her 
Um, her eyes rolled back in her head. She started struggling. She called the doctor by her rapist's name. I'm getting goosebumps right now. And I just started screaming stop. I just started screaming stop because she was not physically present in the room. And right. even at that point in time, knowing nothing about trauma, I knew that was not normal. You know what I mean? Um, so the doctor did stop and um, she came out of it kind of. Um, knowing what I know now, she was fully disassociated. She does not remember a full two week period or did not at the time of her death remember a full two week period after that. Um, but he actually ended up writing her a Xanax prescription and sending us home, asking us to follow up with our therapist. Now, this is the thing. This was our family doctor. He had known her since she was a little girl. He didn't know what the hell to do. I, I'm not I'm really, again, early 2000, like mid mid 2000s, mid early 2000s. Right. This is like 2010 ish, 2011. OK, um, he, he didn't have the access to the knowledge that we have today. I do truly believe now if that happened, somebody would call an ambulance. I, that's what should have happened. Um, but that was really the beginning of the end for her, Steve, because once that bubbled up, that was it. That was it. Um, her PTSD or what we now know to be CPTSD was in full swing from that and, moment on. And can you explain what CPTSD stands for? Mm -hmm. Complex um, post-traumatic stress disorder. And the key difference, as far as I understand it, again, I'm not a mental health professional, but is repeated traumas over uh, over a time frame. It, 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 there's there's different definitions. It's not an official diagnosis just mm. yet, but it, it it is a, you know, layered trauma whether it's from the same trauma and all those layers that go from uh -huh. that or other traumas that are associated uh -huh. with that initial trauma. Uh -huh. and, and again, there's not like a consensus just yet, but you know, it will get there. I'm sure. Yeah. Um, you know, an interest and it's because I, I feel very bad because I don't want to like, uh, f you know, push the story fast forward too much. No, it's understandable. It's a lot. It's a lot, Steve. And, you know, that's why I'm on what I call the mission that I'm on and that my family is on the mission. mission that we're on. So I am all about getting out the message that trauma is the gateway drug, um, the true gateway drug. And when I say drug, I don't just mean like into addiction. I just mean into a whole host of, um, I guess, maladaptive coping mechanisms, I guess is the best way to put that in, in, in later right. life. Um, and one of the ways that plays out is in actual addictions as it did with myself, as it did with my sister. Um, addiction is a symptom of a deeper rooted mental, um, physical, and I believe spiritual malady and trauma is often the source of it. And it doesn't have to be a trauma as severe and as clear cut as a rape. Okay. Um, I had trauma and trauma responses from my parents' divorce, from my mother getting clean, as we discussed in the last episode. So did my sister. Um, it's just that as things progressed, right, we both had kind of the straw that broke the camel's back moment. And I Go just ahead. want to add one thing because I, the myth of normal, which is a book by Gabor Mate, um, love talks him. About, but what I love about what he's talking about trauma, he says that what about if there is no mental illness? And hear me out. Yes, it's mental injury, and I think mm -hmm. I've mentioned this many times before, but I'm going to say it again. So your trauma is your mental injury that you never, and I say you, the royal mm -hmm. you, not just Lynn. This is really the, the subset of leading to depression, leading to anxiety, leading to all that. Uh -huh. And if you can learn how to heal some of these injuries, because it's not usually singular for the record, uh -huh. it's better to adapt to go there versus saying, oh, you got PTSD. Here's a med. Here's depression. Here's a med. Yes. I'm opposed to medication, but I'm not I'm not for medication solving your issues that I am opposed to. <laughs> 
to be fair, it never solved our issues. Um, at one point, my sister was on 10 or 12 different psych meds. Um, there were repeats in the psych meds. So there would be like multiple different antidepressants, multiple different mood stabilizers, multi, multiple different anti-anxiety medications and medications to deal with the symptoms from those medications. You could not tell me even as a completely untrained layman that that was smart or made any sense. Uh, and we could never get her back to a place where she was stable enough to come off all of the meds and then build from the ground up. My sister was never restabilized at the end of the day after that um, flashback in the doctor's office, which again, I didn't have one of those moments because I kept my toe dipped in the pond of the situation. And because of just the nature of who I was as a human being, right? I avoided that. Whereas she went the opposite route. Now, again, neither is right or wrong, but I do believe had she been in with a mental health professional that she trusted, when that happened, we would have been able to get the help she needed. Now, um, maybe not me, the exact stop, help she needed. But let me stop you for a second. Mm -hmm. I, mean, I hate to interrupt. No, but please do. Let's start with a few things. I am not a medically trained person, but I have worked in mental health field for over 20 years. Mm -hmm. And whenever a client comes in and is on over three drugs for mental health reasons, I'm like, Go see your doctor, tell them to figure it out. But there's only three that you should be on. Whatever yeah. that is, they can choose. Mm -hmm. But because once you hit three, four, five, you don't even know if it's an interaction, if exactly. it's this, if it's that. And, you know, a lot of medical professionals have agreed with me. Some would say, well, you don't have a doctor and you didn't <laughs> go to school, but I don't really care about that crap. Um, so let's start with how that. How about how it plays out on the street? Because oh, that, yeah, well, that you look it doesn't at, matter, right? Look, look at my ego. It gets in the way. Yeah. Um, at the end of the day though, I, you know, again, I just want to be, for those who are listening, Lynn knows that I want to get to really like keeping this to a certain amount of time. So I'm not trying to cut Lynn's story and Lynn, you no. know, that obviously, of course, but what happened, what, you know, obviously your sister's no longer here. Uh -huh. What happened? Yeah. Okay. So what happened is after that incident in the doctor's office, it took me two weeks to convince my parents that she needed to be hospitalized. Um, and eventually we got her hospitalized. Um, once we got her hospitalized, I also let them know that she had had a back surgery um, and the father of her children had actually gone off the rails with addiction, which is a whole other story. That was a right. family issue that trickled down to him. Um, and so when she was in that two week period of disassociation, I did catch on that she was recreationally and now self-medicating with um, with pain pills because that was the time frame. Now, I myself had gotten into them um, and at this point had gone to rehab. My sister had organized an intervention um, after the trial. I spent a year addicted to Oxycontin and my sister um, organized an intervention. And my parents sent me to 90 days of treatment down at Gosnold in Cape Cod, which was a very holistic program at the time. And I understand has come even more in that direction um, and had got me stabilized. So I knew what I was looking at when I was seeing her um, doing what she was doing. So I let them know and they didn't want to believe that that was as big of an issue as it it was obviously going to become. So what they tried to do was get her stabilized um, from the from the flashback, from the disassociation, and uh, they sent her to Bornwood, which they, Bornwood did a great job, but my sister was in such a traumatized, like activated state that the treatment was almost re-traumatizing for her. So once she came back into her body um, and realized she didn't remember the previous two weeks and got herself to the point where she could like, you know, string two sentences together and remember what happened yesterday, she got out of there and she still wanted nothing to do with treatment. But now she was in a very activated, uh, unable to push down the memories unable to cope much like I had hit back in high school. Right. Um, and her addiction just started taking off now again, because of the type of human being that she was, whereas I was always very like, Hey, this is what I got going on, like it or not. Um, she would do her damnedest to hide it. And so over the years we went through these cycles of 
it comes out that she's using and her trauma and her using were very linked. So she'd have around the time of the rape in November, she would always have, whether she even realized that was coming or not, like the body remembers, right? The body so keeps the score. Yes. So every, yes. So every um, November she would run into a really rough time. And if she wasn't using, she would inevitably end up using because again, she had no coping mechanisms. Um, so she would, she would start using and then essentially it would be under the radar and then I would start to pick up on it. And then in the beginning, I would start to try to make people aware, but nobody wanted to listen. So eventually I just started trying to be there for her and then something bad would happen. It would come up and we would rinse and repeat, you know, but again, because she had such a negative experience at her first like treatment facility, she was always so, so, so hesitant to, to do any type of treatment. And having never really restabilized, even when she moved into the later part of her life and things like EMDR became available, she shouldn't have been given the EMDR, Steve, because she wasn't stable to begin with. Right. Um, and to circle back to the meds, as things progressed in the medical community, we found out, for example, she was allergic to traditional SSRIs. So things like a traditional anti, you know, depressant that any one of us would be on and a doctor would just throw you right, which her PCP was prescribing uh, at first it made her it made her worse so it was just a, a such a complex web of bullshit and by the time we you know it became clear what was going on it was just too little too late we were never quite able to navigate the system um when at the end of her life we were trying to get her trauma treatment but they wouldn't take her because i'm talking like mclean hospital wouldn't take her because her addiction was out of control and then there were certain treatment facilities for her addiction that wouldn't take her because of her mental health issues. What we really needed was trauma informed care at a rehab. Um, because again, the addiction was a symptom of her untreated trauma. Um, and essentially my father, not once, but twice, uh, once about, I don't know, like five years ago. And uh, again, right before she died, sent her to a private rehab facility because we couldn't find any that were covered by Medicare and MassHealth um, that were anywhere near even promising to be able to provide the care that she needed. And both of those $20,000 a month facilities fell far short of the mark, did not actually provide the care that they purported to right. provide. Um, so really, that's why last last week when you asked me, um, what is the major takeaway? What's the single biggest thing that can be done? Single biggest thing that can be done is early trauma intervention. All right. And adequate trauma intervention. And then you need to couple that with an advocate that knows how to work both the healthcare side of the system and understands the justice system. Because again, both my sister and I were re-traumatized by the process, which both of us did not regret going through. Please don't get me wrong. We got more than a lot of women get. We got convictions. Our, both of our offenders served time, but we were re-traumatized by it. And, it, and that was with a very good advocate. Um, in fact, when I ran into problems recently, because my offender has resurfaced um, at my church um, that he knew was my church. Um, and I've now had to um, dip a toe back into the justice system to see what that's all about and how I go about combating that, right? Um, like that advocate is is still around, right? And even with her, it was, it was re-traumatizing for me. And it's re-traumatizing right now to have to fight for the protections that I was told when I got this conviction 20 years ago that I was going to get now in the process. And this is where I get really angry. And, and, well, and, Lynn, and this Lynn, before we go down this, I think that the justice system stuff might be a good episode, maybe for next season. Oh, I'm down I'd love for to that. Hear that. So, I'm down for that. Obviously your sister's no longer here. Mm -hmm. uh, when did she pass and how did she pass? So she passed in January. And so what happened was, um, Basically, she was struggling through. Um, she was clean for all intents and purposes. Everybody thought that she was clean. She was trying to complete her nursing degree, which she had been working on from the time that she was like uh, 23 years old. Right. Um, and essentially, the stress of trying to complete the nursing degree and trying to raise 
uh, three young children because she subsequently had um, a third child about six years ago, um, got to her and she started to self-medicate again. Now, we didn't know that until it was too late because, as I said, um, she just was the type that would not let on that anything was going on until it was out of control. And by the time that she had graduated um, from from nursing school, she was pretty she was pretty out of control. So that started to present in the home and uh, in her relationship. Her and her husband got into a fight, um, which we come to find out was over drugs and um, DCF became involved. And that is a whole other another thing. And this is where it gets linked back into the justice system, Steve. And that's why. Like for me, that's what triggered this. And I'm not going to go into it right now because, again, it, we could spend a whole other hour um, and I don't want to do that to you or your listeners right now. Um, but the point is the system was not set up to help her once she was at that point. Um, the system saw her as the addict that she was, but not the reason why she was an addict and therefore they gave her a list of action items to accomplish but they did not give her any assistance in accomplishing those action items whereas f about five six years prior when she had gotten clean she was um in drug court which was very much the same thing a list of action items but help accomplishing said action items and she was successful and she was clean for several years off of that um so once that happened once dcf became involved and she was under the microscope. Um, at first, they believed that she was clean and they were, you know, agreeing that um, all of these symptoms, all these issues that she was having were clearly from her trauma. But then when it became clear that it was not just the trauma, but it was also drugs and i actually had to unfortunately make a call to dcf to tell them what was actually going on because my mother was terrified wanted her to get rehab but was afraid to go to say to dcf like she is in fact using i've got the kids they're safe but what do we do um so i took it upon myself to do that at that point it was it was too late um, they ultimately removed the children from my mother's home. Uh, my father took the baby and the uh, twins went into the foster care system for a little bit. My father now has all three children. Um, but that was really the beginning of the end for my sister. Um, that's the point that my father tried to send her to rehab, paid um, $20,000 out of pocket, which, by the way, was a thing that he was told when he showed up. When when they booked the rehab, and, they were and told Lynn, it was I, covered. I, I just want to be very mindful of the time here. Yes, how did she pass? Okay, from drugs. So essentially, um, at the at the tail end of nine months of that, right? Um, they took the kids in March of last year. Nine months in, um, she had just she had just her body had had enough. She had uh, one very near miss of an overdose in October, um, and DCF actually confronted her without a lawyer, um, without an advocate at the last meeting they ever had for with her, let her know that they had discovered that overdose. Now, again, this is in January. Um, so after the overdose, she doubled down her efforts, actually got a therapist, actually was trying. Um, she was an intravenous user. She had put the needle down. She was an opiate user. She had stopped using opiates. Um, we now know she was still dabbling, but harm reduction is the most important thing. And she was working on it. So when they met with her uh, that last week of her life and let her know, look, we found out that you had an overdose in October. We do see that you've increased the activity that you've been doing to try to deal with that since then. But we are changing the goal to adoption. Don't worry your father will be the one to adopt the kids if anybody adopts the kids and hopefully we won't get to that that was too much I was actually with my father when my sister called to talk to him about that and at the at that point in time she was doing everything she could to be in good spirits um she was you know mindful of the fact that they had said that you know they weren't going to be lost to the system mindful of the fact that they had said if she keeps doing what she's doing she'll be okay and they hopefully won't be lost at all um but very, very scared and didn't really see how she was going to accomplish um, the goal of getting the treatment she needed to get back into a place that she needed to be in, in the situation that she was in. And uh, not two days later, um, she had overdosed and, and was dead.
such a sad story and such a side effect of the trauma. Yes. And uh, again, I don't blame anybody, really. Um, it is what it is. We all make our own decisions. So I want to be clear about that. I'm not blaming the system. I'm not even blaming her rapist at the end of the day. But there is a strong argument to be made that Amanda's life um, was on borrowed time from the day that she was raped. Um, you know, well, uh, and, and I, I, what I'd love to do is to reinvite you next season mm. to talk a little bit about the justice system, because we didn't even touch base on that. If that's oh, okay there's with so you. so much going on, Stephen. people can follow it in the media as it plays out. Um, like I said, I am at this point on a mission, um, to become an advocate and an activist for, um, survivors protections on that end of things. But more important to me than that is the trauma as the gateway drug and the conversation about just people becoming more informed about what trauma is, the impact it can have on people, how that actually looks on a day-to-day -day level. Right. Um, and um, basically plugging the holes in the system that allow people like my sister to slip through the cracks. Because again, I had the same opportunities. I came up in the same system. It's simply by virtue of who I am as a human being. And that doesn't make me better or worse than Amanda, just the type of person I am, the fact that I outsource uh, instead of going inside, right? Um, that, that I'm here today. I just had more time to figure my stuff out. That's when, really it. I want to thank you for today and we'll definitely do another episode soon. Yes, thank sir. You so much. Thank you, Steve.